Welcome to chapter 10. This chapter focuses on biotechnology, the use of techniques and tools enabling us to uncover more secrets of the world of cell biology. All the techniques presented in this chapter have been instrumental in enabling us to decipher the information contained in all the other chapters. Once this chapter is assimilated, the students should have a good general grasp of the major popular techniques used by modern cell biology research. Additionally, students should be able to describe how restriction enzymes, also known as endonucleases, work and how they are used to construct artificial DNA molecules. Students should further understand past and current methods of manipulating DNA molecules, and these would include electrophoresis, blotting, probing, and amplification. Alternative cloning systems will also be presented, as well as the very powerful PCR methods used to amplify regions of DNA. And finally, we'll describe different methods of sequencing DNA, including the newer methods which are not included in this chapter. Redirecting evolution is not new to human beings. Manipulation of plants has been ongoing for at least 8,000 years, as has the more recent manipulation of animal species for the benefit of the human race. The official term for this manipulation is artificial selection. The protocol is simple. Breed organisms naturally, and from the resulting offspring, select those with the desired features. Since the advent of modern DNA technology, otherwise known as genetic engineering, we have supplemented artificial selection with engineered solutions. Under certain circumstances, old-fashioned breeding experiments are still used, but these are being replaced rapidly by faster and more cost-effective solutions. One of the great benefits of these newer techniques is that they produce the desired result in the fewest number of steps, unlike nature. The various sections of this chapter are arranged in a hierarchical order, reflecting in essence the order in which these techniques will be applied to a, to a project. The only exception is Part C, a new technology that's emerged since the textbook was written. This progresses us into a warning about the contents of chapter 10. And molecular cell biology is a rapidly changing field and improvements and refinements are occurring almost constantly. Unfortunately, chapter 10 is about four years out of date with some of the newer techniques, but the core technologies are still valid and used in many research labs. At the dawn of genetic engineering, the very first tools discovered were restriction enzymes, otherwise known as restriction endonucleases, because they cut within strands of DNA. But before diving deeper into their functionality, it's important to know their rightful place in natural systems. Bacterial cells manufacture these restriction enzymes to protect themselves from foreign DNA invading their cytoplasm. Their own DNA is protected by methylation at specific sites where the enzymes will recognize the host DNA, therefore protecting the host DNA from these very enzymes. Incoming exogenous DNA, external DNA, which is not suitably methylated, does not have protection from these enzymes. It is degraded and thus neutralized. These natural molecular scissors are found in many, many strains of bacteria, each evolving independently from another strain. So the enzyme in one strain of bacteria may recognize one site, whereas an enzyme from a different bacteria may recognize an alternative site. Some bacteria have multiple restriction enzymes, while most have just one. Restriction enzymes serve two main purposes. One, they allow scientists to cut down DNA to manageable chunks that can be manipulated in bacteria and viruses. And the second goal is to allow us to recombine DNA molecules for purposes of manipulation, both inside organisms and outside. Restriction enzymes are all proteins which have active sites for DNA, double-stranded DNA. Restriction enzymes can be used individually in assays or combined with other restriction enzymes dependent on the needs of the scientist. Restriction enzymes are fantastic in the way that they function. They always recognize a DNA sequence in the palindromic sense. Palindromic simply means whether you approach the DNA by reading the top strand, or you approach the DNA by reading the bottom strand, the sequence is always going to be the same. So if you're reading the sequence in the forward direction on the bottom strand, then the sequence is CCGG. If you're traveling along the top strand in the correct direction, the sequence is CCGG. And the same thing applies every time a restriction enzyme recognizes its cutting site. 
The substrate for all restriction enzymes is double-stranded DNA. It's never RNA and it's never single-stranded DNA. The naming convention for restriction enzymes is based on the name of the strain of bacteria in which they were discovered. So ECHO R1 is a restriction enzyme discovered in E. coli. HE3 is a restriction enzyme discovered in Haemophilus aegyptus. And HIN D3 is a restriction enzyme discovered in Haemophilus influenza. The number of restriction enzymes now available and researched by scientists is over 3,000. Of these 3,000, about 600 are available to purchase in purified form from biotech companies. As evident in this figure, some restriction enzymes cut the backbone of DNA on both strands at the exact same location, generating blunt ends. Other restriction enzymes cut in a staggered fashion in their recognition region. So ECHO R1 cuts between the G and the A on both strands, generating these staggered ends or sticky ends. HIN-D3 does the same thing in its recognition sequence, also generating sticky ends. The sticky ends are important. If the ends of the DNA are not degraded, which normally happens inside bacteria, then there's a potential for these two ends to come back together again and form hydrogen bonds and eventually be ligated together. But we'll see that in subsequent slides. For now, let's continue with some terminology applicable to restriction enzymes. Those restriction enzymes that recognize a site with four nucleotides is called a four cutter. A restriction enzyme that recognizes six nucleotides at its location site is called a six cutter. And if a restriction enzyme recognizes eight nucleotides before cutting, it's called an eight cutter. So Going back to the previous slide, He3 will be a four cutter, Echo R1 is a six cutter, and D3 is also a six cutter. For random samples of DNA, the frequency of four bases occurring in a particular pattern is much more frequent than a eight cutter recognition site. Eight cutters would require all eight nucleotides on one strand of DNA to be in perfect alignment, and that is less likely to happen. Therefore, a four cutter cuts more frequently and generate smaller fragments of DNA compared to an eight cutter, therefore giving a scientist a choice on the size of fragments that can be generated on average by using these different restriction enzymes. Generating short fragments of DNA by using restriction enzymes is a necessary first step in an overall project. The question is, what do you do once you have these fragments inside a test tube? The direction in which one can proceed are manifold, but one of the most common utilizations of restriction fragments is to separate the DNA according to size on a gel electrophoresis platform. Gel electrophoresis entails loading the DNA into a well of a agarose or polyacrylamide gel and then applying an electric current. We know from previous lectures that the backbone of DNA contains phosphate groups, these phosphate groups which are negatively charged. So DNA, as the name suggests, deoxyribonucleic acid, is a negatively charged molecule. Applying an electric current will force the DNA to migrate towards the positive electrode, and that is called the anode. The DNA migrates through the gel, not based on the sequence of the nucleotides, rather on the length of the DNA fragment, i.e. the number of nucleotides. The smaller fragments migrate the furthest, because they find it easy to weave in and out of the matrix, i.e. the pores making the gel. The larger fragments are hindered, they get trapped in the gel, therefore slowing down their progress. So larger DNA fragments are closer to the wells, and smaller DNA fragments are proportionately more distant from the wells. By running a marker on the same DNA gel, one can then quantify the size of these fragments, if one wishes to. DNA is not visible in itself, therefore different staining techniques or UV light illumination have to be applied to visualize the DNA under special lighting conditions. Once the DNA has been separated on a gel, the question is what do you do next? Again, the options depend on the project. One could just determine the size of the fragments, if that's what the project requires. One could cut out certain fragments and clone them to make more fragments of that particular type, or one could just determine the sequence of those fragments for analysis purposes. If a relatively large piece of DNA is cut with restriction enzymes, then there is a heterogeneous population of fragments that 
would normally be visible on a gel. The question is, which one of those fragments is the one that corresponds to your region of interest? One possible method is to use a probe from another source, maybe another organism, or from information gathered by another scientist about that region of DNA to identify a corresponding match within your gel. So for instance, a probe for an enzyme from mice could be used to determine a corresponding region of DNA in a human. The probe is normally single-stranded DNA. It could be RNA. The single-stranded DNA is somehow labeled with a fluorescent chemical or made radioactive by the use of radioisotopes. The probe will then be applied to single-stranded DNA in the gel. The probe will bind to corresponding complementary sequence and identify itself either by fluorescing or by activating an X-ray photographic film if it's radioactive. Regardless, the process is as follows. The first step is to separate your DNA in a suitable gel. Agros gels are used for relatively large pieces of DNA and polyacrylamide gels are used for relatively small pieces of DNA. However, both types of gel are very fragile because they're made mostly of water they do dehydrate and break apart very easily. So the experiment cannot be performed on the gel itself. The next step is to transfer the DNA directly out of the gel onto a more usable piece of nylon or nitrocellulose paper, which can be utilized indefinitely for further experimentation. A standard way of doing this was developed by a scientist known as Southern. So the process of transferring DNA from a flimsy gel onto a more permanent nitrocellulose paper using this type of wicking effect with paper towels sucking up the buffer and transferring the DNA from the gel to the paper is known as Southern transfer in honor of that scientist. One of the consequences of using an alkaline buffer solution is that during the transfer, the DNA molecules are separated from each other to form single-stranded DNA rather than double-stranded DNA, which makes probing with a single-stranded probe very feasible. Once the DNA has been transferred to the nitrocellulose paper, the paper is removed, placed in a microwave oven for a few seconds and that fixes the DNA permanently to the paper such that the sample can be used multiple times without deterioration. The labeled probe is then introduced into a bag in which the nitrocellulose paper is placed. The bag is sealed and then at the appropriate temperature and with the appropriate buffer included inside the bag, incubation is performed generally overnight. When the fluorescence is detected or the X-ray film is developed, the bands corresponding to the binding of the probe are highlighted and can then be characterized, dependent on the project. Incidentally, other techniques have since been developed based on similar procedures but utilizing different types of starting material. So southern blots are reserved for DNA analysis. Northern blots are reserved for RNA analysis. Western blots have been used for separating proteins and detecting them. There is no such thing as eastern blots at the moment, but it will be nice to complete the compass based on Southern's name. What does one do next once they have identified a fragment of DNA in the gel using a probe? One common strategy is to clone that fragment. Cloning entails inserting the fragment into the DNA of a different organism. How does one achieve this? Well, if we go back to the restriction enzymes, you'll see that they do present a beautiful solution in themselves. If the DNA is cut by one particular restriction enzyme, it'll have a particular pattern of ends. If the bacterial chromosome is also cut with the same restriction enzyme, it'll have a complementary cut where the two fragments can come together inside the bacterial cell or inside the test tube and overlap. Held together by hydrogen bonds and completed by DNA ligase, you regenerate a hybrid DNA molecule. This process generates a recombinant molecule. That recombinant molecule can be used for a number of different cloning strategies. Incidentally, 
if one is forced by circumstances to utilize two different restriction enzymes on the two fragments of DNA, the bacterial and the clone, then there is a strategy that allows different sticky ends to be joined together utilizing extra steps. If the top fragment is from your DNA digest with say echo R1 and some other scientist has supplied you with a fragment of blunt bacterial chromosome, then the, these two fragments could not in any way be ligated together. So one strategy is to use DNTPs and DNA polymerase to just replicate a short fragment of DNA to get a blunt end. Then these two blunt ends could now be combined together as illustrated here to generate your hybrid molecule. So this strategy is only used when necessary when you're using different restriction enzymes. We mentioned that our DNA fragment, which we obtained from the gel, could be cloned into a bacterial chromosome. That's number two in this list. But the most common and obvious target for cloning is a plasmid. A plasmid is basically an extra piece of DNA carried by bacterial cells. A plasmid is shown here. A plasmid is normally much, much, much smaller than the actual chromosome of bacteria. Plasmids can exist in multiple copy numbers. So whereas a bacterial cell may have just one chromosome, it can have hundreds of plasmids, each carrying your fragment of interest. Alternatively, we can then, alternatively, we can ligate our DNA fragment into yeast chromosomes, into other human chromosomes. In fact, Using this technology, we can clone our DNA into the DNA of any other living or non-living entity. In this slide, we're looking at a simple strategy where the plasmid is cut open using a restriction enzyme to make it linear. The DNA fragment has already been cut with the same restriction enzyme. And now if the two are placed into the same test tube under appropriate conditions, the DNA fragment has the potential to now be inserted inside the plasmid and the plasmid would be made whole again by DNA ligase. What is the purpose of putting our fragment into a plasmid? One reason would be to amplify the number of fragments to usable quantities. If we have just a few fragments, there's not much we can do with them. If we amplify or multiply the number of fragments into billions, if not trillions, then we have more to work with and more manipulations are possible. A great example of the early adoption of this technology has to do with the human growth hormone. Prior to genetic engineering, doctors used to get human growth hormone for injection into people that needed it from the glands of dead people. The issues were that it was a very laborious process, it was very expensive, and sometimes contamination would kill the patients. Once we discovered the location of the human gene for human growth hormone, it was simply a matter of isolating that gene and then cloning it into a plasmid in bacteria. The plasmids were then transformed into bacteria, and now we can get a limitless supply of proteins which the bacteria make using the gene inserted into them. These proteins are then extracted from these bacteria, purified and sold as a drug to the pharmaceutical industry. This slide summarizes the entire procedure from start to finish. We begin with a bacterial cell. We transform our insert, our recombinant insert containing our human gene into that bacteria. This is normally done by using calcium chloride and heat shocking the bacteria so that it uptakes external DNA through a natural process. Regardless, once the plasmid is inside the bacteria, the bacteria are then grown to enormous quantities inside incubators via reactors, and then the bacterial cells can be broken open, releasing the plasmids, which are now available in huge quantities. The plasmids can be purified, and then if you use the same restriction enzyme as you originally cut the plasmids, you can now recover the red human genes if that is your desire. How does one know which bacterial cells 
contain plasmids, which contain the gene of interest. One strategy is to plate the bacteria onto a Petri dish after they've been grown overnight. Then using the same type of nitrocellulose paper that we used earlier in the southern blot, we can then transfer the bacteria onto nitrocellulose and then probe the bacterial colonies that are stuck to the paper with a radioactive probe. The probe will then highlight only those colonies of bacteria that contain the interesting fragments of DNA. Because we know where the colonies are, we can go back to the original plate and regrow only those colonies. Yet another alternative method that has materialized over the years is to make a genomic library from a particular organism. This could be a human genomic library, a mouse genomic library. In fact, any living organism can have a genomic library made from its chromosomes. The method is quite straightforward. You somehow cut the DNA down to a suitable size by using restriction enzymes or even sonication, which is the use of sound. Once those fragments are of a suitable size, they're then inserted into plasmids, and those plasmids are then transformed into bacteria. The desire is that every bacteria will contain a fragment of your original DNA. All the bacteria that are now in that population should technically contain every fragment of every chromosome from the original source of DNA. That combination of bacteria is now known as a genomic library, which can then be used by the scientists to scan for any human gene if this library was a human genomic library. These libraries can be easily replicated by growing them and then sharing amongst other scientists. And they can be visited again and again to answer different questions. A valuable offshoot of a genomic library is something known as a cDNA library. cDNA libraries are not constructed from genomic DNA. Rather, they are constructed from messenger RNA. As we learned in previous lectures, some cells in your body only express certain messenger RNAs. Other cells express different messenger RNAs. So the goal of the analysis is to investigate a particular tissue to see what kind of messenger RNAs and proteins it's making is more valuable than to analyze the messenger RNA rather than the total genomic DNA, which will be the same between all the cells of the body. In this more sophisticated approach, the cells are first disrupted to release messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is captured by a column that can bind to the poly A tail. All the other nucleic acid is then discarded, including genomic DNA. The messenger RNA is single-stranded. The first step is to make DNA from the messenger RNA. By adding a poly T primer, you now have a three primed end which a special enzyme known as reverse transcriptase can bind to and start making a copy of DNA based on the sequence of the RNA as indicated here in red. These molecules are no good for constructing libraries because the RNA strand has to be replaced. So using RNAs, an enzyme that digests RNA and a suitable primer we can replace the RNA component of the hybrid molecule with a fresh copy of the DNA. In the presence of DNA polymerase, the primer is extended and we have now a double-stranded piece of DNA. These fragments are then cloned into bacteria as indicated on the previous slide. This will then constitute a cDNA library. In this example, we are only extracting the messenger RNA from brain cells of, say, an adult. The messenger RNA is then converted into double-stranded DNA, and a library is then made. That library will then be sold as a brain adult cDNA library, and it will represent just those DNA molecules made from messenger RNA that represent the pool of active genes in that tissue at that particular time a very useful way of comparing diseased organs with normal organs. On this slide, we're simply comparing the two methods of making 
libraries. The genomic library is made through a sequence of events which are straightforward, whereas a cDNA library has an extra sequence of steps which have to be performed. In addition, the cDNA library will represent the DNA fragments in the proportions in which they existed inside the cytoplasm of the cell. In this particular example, gene B is more active than gene A, even though both are present in one copy each. The final library will then have multiple copies of the cDNA corresponding to the activity of gene B compared to gene A. In this way, by probing for these different DNA molecules, one can generate a relative abundance of which gene was active relative to the other genes.